My name is Peter Beck and I run the Centre for Collective Intelligence Design at Nesta, the UK's Innovation Foundation. Um, as part of our work on collective intelligence, one of the areas of interest has been crowdfunding and for the last 10 years or so we've been looking at uh, the different ways in which crowdfunding is both an innovation in finance and a way of finding and funding innovative projects. And at the, in this short module, I'm going to give a quick introduction to what crowdfunding is and how we're providing uh, new tools and methods to improve disaster response um, to the COVID-19 crisis through mobilizing people and their money in new ways. So uh, quickly, I'm going to cover what crowdfunding is and how it can help communities raise funds, uh, how crowdfunding um, and it can lead to different forms of uh, investment and support for mutual aid and collective support initiatives, and finally, I'm going to talk a bit about match crowdfunding and how we can combine uh, funding from big institutions like foundations and government with funding from the crowd. So first of all, what is crowdfunding? Well, at its simplest, it can be described as the way of finding and funding projects, businesses and loans through lots of small donations and contributions from large numbers of sources rather than large amounts from a few, such as a bank or an investment fund. Uh, we generally talk about there being these five models of uh, crowdfunding, so reward-based, that's what we know from platforms like Kickstarter and others, where you essentially pre-purchase a product, um, so you back a campaign to develop a video game or uh, a new product, and then uh, the development of the product goes ahead, and if it's successful, uh, you get something in return, like the game or a nice gadget. Then there's the donation-based model, um, here you give money towards the campaign, um, but all you get in return is a good feeling of having supported typically what is a worthy cause, so a project by a, a charity or a social enterprise. Um, then you have equity-based crowdfunding. This is where the crowd buys um, small shares in companies with the, with the hope of making a, a big financial return if the company succeeds uh, in, in, in the future uh, through an exit or takeover. And then you have community shares, which is a form of social equity, where you buy uh, shares in, in social businesses. Uh, and then finally, you have the kind of lending-based model, which is also is called peer-to-peer -peer lending. Essentially here, uh, you crowdfund uh, a loan by buying lots of small parts of an overall loan for a company through a platform, uh, which is then uh, used to fund uh, typically uh, an SME. Um, and then that uh, kind of loan is paid back with interest to the crowd. As you can see from this slide, the kind of average sizes of those uh, kind of investments vary a lot by the models, uh, with the biggest amount of money typically going into kind of equity-based crowdfunding uh, um, projects and lending-based projects, whereas rewards and donations are, are much smaller. So there are some interesting examples of kind of debt, debt and equity approaches to new solutions um, that responds to the COVID-19 crisis. Um, I've broken down this slide into kind of three main types, um, investing in companies, providing medical solutions. Um, so there is even kind of talk about trying to kind of crowdfund a vaccine, although I don't think that is a feasible kind of route of finance for, for that. Um, lots of investment now going on into companies and businesses that kind of respond to the crisis um, and the different effects of it, such as a food delivery service, for example. And then there are some examples of kind of beginning to crowdfund loans or peer-to-peer -peer debt uh, to businesses that are struggling um, as a result of, of the crisis. However, uh, I think that the, the biggest opportunity, in, at least in the short term, in, in, in a crisis response using crowdfunding is through donations as, and, and rewards. Um, so uh, what I listed there is I think that uh, these models work specifically well for kind of medium-sized projects that need finance and won't be able to uh, back us anything in, in, in return beyond the good feeling of having supported their project. Um, whereas, of course, that you, you can get a, some sort of um, a gadget or, or product in return if it's a rewards-based campaign. Um, typically, uh, what you can raise is less than 15K, although there are examples of both the nation and rewards uh, campaigns that, that, that are higher than that, but they're typically for kind of small amounts of funding. Um, people who back these projects are typically driven by social motivations and wanting to kind of resolve a kind of a, a social issue or a challenge or problem rather than making a financial uh, kind of um, uh, benefit uh, out of contributions and uh, typically there's quite a fast turnaround so most campaigns once they're live last around uh, four weeks from kind of kicking off to um, to the money being paid out to the project if it's successful so just quickly in terms of how crowdfunding works so uh, it's more complicated than what I've listed in this, in this model but uh, essentially there are these kind of five stages of crowdfunding and the initial bit is you you, you find a crowdfunding platform typically and on that platform you, you pitch your project um, so you tell people what you want to do I, I want to set up a community business I want to kind of buy a food cart um, and you list that on, on uh, and pitch it to the platform 
Um, the platform then does a screening to check that you kind of meet the requirements. First of all, that you're not trying to do anything illegal, but also that you meet the kind of general platform criteria for the kind of projects that they want to launch and the model that they support. Then your pitch goes live. Um, and this is where the public gets to see your, your idea and your project and how much money you want to raise and what, if anything, they get in return for, for kind of committing money to your project. And that's when people can start pledging money. And typically you kind of say, well, say I need to raise £15,000 and people can kind of say this ticker going up of, of money being raised as you um, as your campaign develops. Uh, and this is where you really want to kind of campaign hard to make sure you mobilize as many, many people as possible to give towards your, your project. Uh, some platforms operate with a kind of keep it all model, which means that no matter how much money you raise, even if you don't hit your kind of funding goal, you can still take out the money that you do raise towards your project. Whereas others uh, operate what's called an all or nothing model where um, you only get to uh, take the money out if you hit your, uh, your funding target. Once, uh, say, you hit your funding target, um, the money is then released from the platform to the project and you then go out and develop it. Um, and at this point, you keep uh, contact with your backers to say how you're spending the money and how your project is progressing, but also um, kind of what you're spending the money on. And if you are developing a product, then when they can respect to get that product. And finally, of course, you ship the product um, if when it's developed. So we've already seen lots of examples of, of, of crowdfunding being used to address the COVID-19 crisis. So uh, some examples includes um, typically kind of help raise directly for kind of community activities, supporting people directly affected by the crisis, i.e. Um, help uh, someone local um, raise money f uh, to uh, buy some um, essential items. Um, We've seen a lot of campaigns aimed at buying essential items for those working in health and care services, like PPE equipment. Um, also, a lot of interesting initiatives going around to try and essentially keep local businesses afloat by pre-purchasing products from them. So saying to a local bar, brewery, shop that you want to buy vouchers or pre-buy uh, beer from them so that in, in the future you can kind of go on and, and cash in on that. But in the short term, they get some cash um, into the company. And then there are also uh, some initiatives kind of looking into crowdfund debt and other bills um, that people who, for example, have lost their jobs because of the crises. Um, so no one can no longer pay health care, Medicare um, bills, education um, that um, so kind of crowdfund um, uh, project that kind of free up funds to, to pay, pay the debt off so people don't go into, into hardship. The kind of uh, the crisis has always brought uh, along a whole range of kind of mutual aid initiatives typically aimed at either uh, providing mutual aid for a, like a hyper local area such as a street or a small kind of uh, local area in a the city or place uh, or kind of mutual aid aimed at helping a specific uh, group of people who might be uh, um, at risk uh, so for example uh, care workers um, as, as we have seen one example of on, on the slide there um, and in, in this case crowdfunding is being used to almost like crowdfunding create a pool of funding that can then be drawn down by the mutual aid group to to fund a number of activities like food shops um, or supporting a local food bank uh, covering uh, fuel costs um, setting up a specific fund, as I mentioned, for, for vulnerable care workers or the cost related to, to volunteering. But it's almost like a very kind of local initiative to try and create a pool of funds that they can be drawn down on um, to make sure that the mutual aid activities um, sustain themselves. So I think it's really important to stress here that crowdfunding is really hard to do um, and many, many campaigns fail. Depending on which platform you go to, failure rates range between 20, 40, 60 um, to 80 percent. Um, uh, but there are a lot of things you can do to really uh, improve your, your campaign. And we listed in, 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 in our report, Crafting Good Courses, and in a number of blogs, kind of a number of different tips uh, for how you can best best do that. I'm not going to go into too much detail on it here, but just to say that I think the main thing is that you start by budgeting, like be realistic about how much money you need and what you need it for. And if there's anything in, in, in return um, that people get in return, then really clear about how your budget's gonna kind of help you deliver that product or service. Um, find the best platform uh, for your campaign, which I'll go into in a bit more detail later. Um, be really clear and transparent with, with people who you want to give you money about what you're trying to achieve and what they'll get in return, if anything. Tell a story, so typically your personal story or your kind of community group's personal story. Who are you, uh, why is this important, and why should people back you? And if you, at all possible, try and make a short video, two minutes, um, made on your on your uh, smartphone, um, just to kind of put a, a face and a, and a voice behind the, the course. 
try not to think of the launch date of the campaign as as when you go live, but uh, if possible, pre-launch. So make sure you get possible backers uh, lined up way before you launch your campaign on the crowdfunding platform so that the day you go live, you have lots of people ready to support and back your course. Make sure who it is that you want to back you. So you will typically have um, the people who you know want to give to you, so friends, family, people in your core community. Make sure you kind of reach out to and target those people really early on. But alongside that, kind of also map out who are the kind of two, second, third, and fourth tier of, of backers that you want to reach, reach out to. So people on your street, people with connections to your local community, for example, and figure out what is the best way of reaching them, direct mail, Facebook, Twitter, other social media channels, maybe even a phone call if it's a really important backer. Make sure you get the rewards right if there are any. So make sure they're relatively cheap for you to make and um, and have quite, quite a lot of emotional or kind of social value to the people who you, you want to reach. Um, use stretch targets. So ideally set a quite a low, particularly if this is your first campaign, a low target for fundraising. So make sure it's kind of relatively feasible. So say a thousand pounds will help you kind of buy uh, kind of one food cart or one round of shopping um, and then add a num num number of kind of stretch targets which means that you can go up to two, three, four, five thousand and make clear to people what they get in return and um, the more you stretch the, the target and the more they keep giving to, to your campaign. And while you do that, keep engaging, communicating with your with your backers, um, both when, you, when you're doing well but also if, if you're not doing well. And I think the most important tip of all of these is to really steal and copy as much as you can from other campaigns. Most, most great ideas have already been thought of somewhere else um, and I really encourage you to trawl through all the crowdfunding platforms, copy uh, different ideas for how to um, uh, explain the pitch, uh, rewards, communicate uh, ideas um, to backers. There are now thousands of platforms out there that will help you launch your crowdfunding uh, platform, <coughs> plat <coughs> campaign and I think there are lots of different ways which you can kind of look at which one works best for you. Um, but here are kind of five things I think you should ask of any platform. First of all, do they offer the right model for you? Secondly, um, what model do they operate in terms of what happens if you don't reach your funding target? Is it all or nothing or keep it all? Does the platform specialize in a, in a particular type of project? Uh, I, some people, uh, some projects um, and platforms specialize in, for example, legal aid, film, food, others are much more general. What support would they provide to your specific project? I will just help you launch a campaign or will they also give you some campaign advice, for example? And what does it cost? So uh, in the case of COVID-19, a lot of uh, platforms actually wa waive their platform fees, but otherwise platforms tend to charge a kind of between th 3 and 5% fee to launch a campaign. And on top of that, there's typically kind of payment fees as well. So double check what, what those fees are and, and be clear on them with the platform before you start your, your campaign. So that's what crowdfunding is and I think how it can help kind of uh, support different causes in, in, in the case of COVID-19. So I think that's what it is in terms of the relationship between the crowd and, um, and you and your project. In match crowdfunding, you then bring in uh, another, another element. So, so the idea of kind of combining institutional funding, typically from uh, kind of governments, big foundations, NGOs, um, or really wealthy individuals uh, with the crowds um, and, and combining that in, in a kind of new setup. And we looked at that in a number of different reports at Nesta and recently in a big experiment on funding arts and heritage projects here in, here in the UK. Um, and I guess the first thing is to say there's lots of questions on, you know, how do you, what's, what's the best dynamic between the crowd and, and the institution and the platform? And we talk about these four models. In first, the institution says, we believe in this project and then the crowd follows. Um, bridging, uh, where um, the crowd comes in first, institution kind of gets um, uh, the project over the middle line, typically when it hits the kind of 40% uh, uh, and then the crowd tops up in the end and, and gets the project over the finishing line. Then there's a top up model where uh, the crowd invests up front in the project and if it hits a certain target, typically around 70-75%, then the last 25% is committed by an institutional funder. And then there's kind of real-time funding, which is one-to-one, -one, where for every kind of pound or dollar donated by an institution or the, uh, by the crowd, the institution kind of matches it until the funding target is hit. Um, we've listed in our research a number of different kind of motivations and challenges in this. I think the, um, the main kind of motivations are that it's an opportunity to leverage more money um, and also attract uh, new people who uh, and new projects that the... Uh, funders, so institutions would not normally um, kind of reach. Um, but it's very complex and very hard to manage, of course. The main main challenge being, uh, you know, 
crowds are typically quite chaotic, uh, switch on and off, and kind of can often have quite niche or kind of um, different demands than institutions can have, which are a bit more rigid and structured, uh, and perhaps also a bit more slow moving. Um, so it requires adaption on both sides in terms of making the, the process work. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, at Nesta we've run a kind of match crowdfunding experiment for um, uh, arts and heritage projects in the UK. And we found kind of three main interesting kind of pieces of evidence from, from kind of matching a quarter of a million of arts and heritage money with, with donations from the crowd. One, um, it can help funders leverage more money for the causes they want to target. Um, and through the offer of the match, funders can incentivize crowdfunding and drive more people towards giving to local courses. So, um, and finally, the uh, it's not just about money. Um, so petitioning crowdfunding can lead to lots of non-financial contributions from supporters including volunteering, donation, space and good. Uh, and I'm going to give a couple of examples of that now. So in, in, in the project we ran, we put in a quarter of a million in, in pounds in, in, into a match funding pot uh, and matched that with donations from the crowd um, and that enabled leveraging an additional £400,000 from, from the crowd of around about 4,970 backers. So uh, quite, quite a strong uh, leverage. So at a minimum for every pound invested, uh, £1.40 um, what was donated towards um, the project by, by the crowd. I think the really interesting bit in this slide is, is that what it shows is that it helps attract new people to local courses. So of the people who back the projects that we helped fund with the Match Crowdfunding project, 86% um, had never backed a project financially before. So it brings in new people and new money. Uh, most people weren't familiar with this kind of sector before. So one in five had never um, backed arts and heritage projects before um, and also people given in addition to what they would normally give so they don't see the money they give through crowdfunding as what they would normally give to charitable courses so 78% said that this money was in addition to what they'd normally give, give to charity which shows that this is a way of leveraging more money enabling more money to go to the courses rather than just replacing money that would be spent elsewhere in the same same sector um, I think this slide is interesting in that it, it shows that beyond the money, there's a huge range of non-financial um, benefits that could come from, from crowdfunding. So 85% 80, of the projects that receive funding through our, our work uh, reported receiving non-financial contributions from the crowd. So really demonstrating the, the opportunity to, to kind of really leverage not just uh, money, but also uh, other, other forms of, of support, which can often long be more valuable to projects. Um, and in the long term, 64% reported gaining more supporters for the projects. Um, and also people uh, who did fundraising often reported finding other forms of collaborators and then from new board members to joint partners um, for their project through the crowdfunding process. I think the other thing that's quite interesting is that crowdfunding enables you to both target kind of local and global. Um, so as the kind of model on the left hand side there show, um, you know, while 41% of backers live within 10 miles of the project, if, and that does, does show that this is a way of tapping into kind of your local community. It's also interesting to, to see that, you know, 30% you know, live more than 250 miles, 100, more than 100 miles away from, from, from the project. So again, kind of showing the, the kind of ability to kind of tap into both a kind of a, a geographically kind of um, close community, but also a global community who share kind of the same kind of uh, course and, and drive as the people fundraising. So that was kind of a very short introduction to what crowdfunding is and what it could help do. I think in the context of kind of COVID-19, I'd say there are kind of three things I'd encourage you to do next. Uh, first, <laughs> check that anyone else is trying to do what you want to do. Um, there are lots of crowdfunding campaigns popping up at, at, during a time of crisis uh, for, for the same thing. Um, so if you see someone else doing what you do, um, stop your own campaign, join forces, or maybe at least give them some money. Um, if there are no one else doing what you want to do in your area, then try it, but start small and add stretch targets. As I mentioned earlier, I think the first thing you can do is, is, is just try and experiment. Um, and thirdly, I'd say be prepared to fail. Um, lots of campaigns fail the first time around, but just trying to set up a crowdfunding campaign, which is free, except for the time you spent on it, um, will give you a lot of valuable lessons that you can then apply to try and crowdfund again in the future. So. We have lots and lots of free resources on Nesta's website. Uh, and if you have any questions about what crowdfunding is and how it can help you or your project, please just drop me uh, an email or send me a tweet. Thank you.